grab your Bibles. Let's get to work. To God be the glory for the things that he has done, for what he is doing, and for what he's about to do. I'm so incredibly excited to be in the house of God with the people of God. Can I tell you how excited it is? Exciting it is to be in the presence of God's people. My global family, thank you. My eat, my global church, thank you so much for being with us today and worshiping with us. I pray that you have your lifted hands, that you were honoring God with the fruit of your lips, that you were praising and magnifying him because we believe you are a part of this celebration. Amen. I said amen, family. Amen. It's amazing. I know some of you are a little warm. Uh, that's all. Go old school, fan yourself. Amen. We actually turned the heat the air off we actually canceled the air earlier in the last service so i know that it's going to be a little warmer this service that that means you're going to have to slap your neighbor to keep them awake slap them slap them keep them awake but there's a a uh, treatment center a mile away from here and on days of treatment i don't know why they chose sunday the the, the air permeates <laughs> throughout the whole region and so it was inside the building and you much rather smell your neighbor now than smell what we smelled earlier oh believe me I had people side eye looking at their neighbors like is that you you need to excuse yourself or something you all right you know when people start saying they don't want to really come out and say did you so they say you okay that's code for, did, was that you? Did you do that? Worst thing in the world is to be on the airport, airplane and have to ask somebody, are you all right? So again, bear with us. Thank you for bearing with us. We'll go old school. You got paper, you got something in your purse, just do this right here. Do this right here. We don't have any fans with Martin Luther King on it, but... <laughs> you know that fake family that every fan had on it in church? <laughs> Turn with me to Genesis, the first chapter, verse 27. God, give me grace to do this. I need your help. Genesis 1 and 27. Speak, God, because we're listening. We want to hear a word from you. Empower us, encourage us, uplift us, enlighten us. Teach us, O oh God, the ways of your word and your wisdom. And help us to observe them with our whole heart. Genesis 1 and 27. When you found it, say amen. amen. So, God created man. Now, understand that when he says man here, it's not speaking of man or male. It's speaking of mankind. God created mankind in his own image. Then he classifies and qualifies. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You got it? So God created mankind. And in his image, he created him, mankind. And then he specifies and classifies. Male and female, he created them. You got it? God, give me grace to preach in this place. Use me mightily. Open our eyes that we might see. Open our hearts that we might receive. Open our minds that we might understand. Give us a greater understanding of who you are and who we are and how to even relate to one another. We want to be first and foremost in a covenant relationship with you because we know that gives us what we need in order to be in relationship with our brothers and sisters here on pavement level. And so we need you. I need you. They need you. We all need you. Speak, God speak we want to have a good time in you today and it's in your name the name that can that shall that will the name that is above every other name that we claim our victory in advance that we don't have to wait till we see it we already see it thank you that relationships marriages will be stronger men and women will be stronger because of this time together in jesus name we declare this victory by saying thank you lord, thank you, lord. come on say thank you lord, thank you, lord. and amen, amen. You may be seated in the presence of our incredible God. Thank you, Lord. You can, you can, um, family, you can turn the air back on now. My God, today. Amen. Genesis 1 and 27. So God created man in his own image. In his image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Uh, any, any sisters in the house? Glory to God in the highest. Any single sisters in the house? Oh, y'all gonna stand up. <laughs> All right. Brothers, that was my way. I was trying to show you who was single. I was trying to, 
I was trying to help y'all out. Brother got y'all. I had y'all last week. I put your feet under the fire last week. This week, I'm ministering to the sisters. Glory to God in the highest. You felt the Holy Ghost just sweep through the room. So, before I get started and before I get into the heart of our message today, uh, I need all the sisters to say amen. amen. Come on, all the real sisters say glory to God. Glory to God. All the believing sisters say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And all, all, of my, all of my soul sisters in the house of God, all of the people of God, all the sisters, all the, the women who really want a deeper relationship with God say preach, pastor. I had to get that in up front. Because that's probably the last thing I'm going to get out of y'all all day long. I needed to put that in my spirit. Because once I get rolling, I don't think y'all going to be saying amen. <laughs> Men and women are made with certain similarities. There are certain foundational dynamics of our existence that cause us to be alike for example we're both we're all made or both men and women are made by the same god we believe that god according to the scriptural text created he male and female he created them we're made from the same substance god has in unalienable unalienably that's what you get for trying to use big words he has unalienable that's like when we try to be proper, you say, hey, man, <laughs> put a T on everything and make it sound better. But God has put and invested within us certain things that are attributed only to God, but they are universal in both male and female. We are alike in some other dynamics that we are all privileged to have the same access to God. We all communicate to him. We all can talk to him. We all can fellowship in, with him. So we have a lot of similarities in the foundation of our existence. God is the source. God is the creator. God created both male and female. And he is the reason that we have these dynamic similarities. But we can also attest if you really have experienced anything as it relates to relativity between men and women. That men and women are similar, but they also at the same time can be worlds apart. They can be distinctively different. In many regards, they can be worlds apart in how they think, how they process, how they handle information, what they do with the information, how they feel, their sensory perceptions, how they how they communicate and articulate their feelings. Those of you who took the five love languages test, you can attribute this dynamic to your reality that now you understand prayerfully better how your spouse communicates their love, their affection, their affinity for you and vice versa. They, they are different in worlds apart in how they love. That's what the love language test was all about, to show you. How many of you already taken the love language test? Were any of you surprised? No, you kind of knew? Yeah, I was surprised, so y'all can say that if you want to. Thank you. But it, it's imperative that we understand this because there are differences. You different from me, me different from you, but even, even deeper than that, male different from female. They also are be worlds apart or can be worlds apart in how they respond to life, how they deal with life's challenges, life's struggles, life's victories, life's triumphs. They have different means, different methodologies, different approaches. Now, there will always be exceptions to the rule. There will always be certain idiosyncrasies, certain dynamics, certain facets or components of your personality that don't necessarily fit a general mold. That we understand. But in large and as a whole, Generally speaking, men and women have these vast distinctive differences. And they are extremely different in terms of even what they need. Men have a specific set of emotional needs just as women have a specific set of emotional needs. Last week, I dealt with the men's needs, what women's needs rather, what, what women need from a man. This week, I want to take it a step further and deal with what I know men need from a woman men and women are different and that becomes a challenge because it becomes the source of contention when we don't understand the fact that we are different creatures 
we then have a, 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 an expectation, an unrealistic and unreasonable expectation on the significant other, on our spouse. We have an unreasonable expectation that causes us to now be uh, full of disdain or resentment or it breeds contention, contention or division or discord. Are y'all with me? And so we have to be mindful of these differences because it allows us to be able to relate to each other more. I won't expect you to be one way when I know distinctively and instinctively you are wired completely different. Men and women are so different that it doesn't even, it, it's not even a personality dynamic. It's not even a, a philosophical understanding. It's not even a, a specific approach or a behavioral or existential feeling or sentiment, but it goes deeper than that. Even in our anatomical composition, not in the obvious dynamics, but even deeper than that, at the foundational level, men and women develop different, they mature different. More importantly, they are in their genetic composition, in the very DNA of their bodily, their bodily uh, makeup. They are different. For example, men and women don't see in the same way. And I don't mean that metaphorically. I'm not meaning that. I mean that in a literal sense. From the very start of light hitting the retina to the information arriving at the cerebral cortex being processed into activity or actions, this process between males and females is distinctively different. The male's retina is thicker than the female's retina, which means literally they don't see the same way. Females, if you look, they did a sociolog sociologist did a study between female babies and male babies, and female babies responded better to faces, whereas male babies responded better to moving objects. They wanted things moving, things fast paced. Sound familiar, car show people? Midlife crisis people, <laughs> they wanted movement, whereas women or female babies wanted a face or a stationary picture to fix themselves on. Even in addition to that, females hear better than males. I thought the sisters would at least take advantage of this first opportunity for you to say amen. <laughs> In the brain, in the centers of the brain that control language and hearing, women have 11% more neurons than men. So literally, they hear better. So, so sisters, it's not their fault. <laughs> Brothers, I'm going to need the. Let me practice this right now. Brothers, I need y'all to say amen. amen. Now, don't y'all leave me out here by myself. One thing I am celebrating is that my wife ain't here today. Thank you, Jesus. But the challenge is she's still watching. So I need y'all to please give me some amen. Brothers, let's practice one more time. Say amen. amen. Yeah, I saw you turn it on. I turned it on too. Here's another thing. A woman's brain is more flexible than a man's. You better hold on before you say amen. <laughs> At a very special point or specific points in life, a woman will experience a major reconstruction of, of her brain. Her stress circuits will become suppressed. Her cortex will increase in size. And the rest of her brain will experience shrinkage. Come on, brothers. My God, today. Let me finish the thing. I wanted to just leave it right there, but I got to go on and tell the whole truth. She won't lose any brain cells. <laughs> but her pathways will change and new networks will form until her brain is back to its normal size. Why are you looking at him like that? Nah. <laughs> Amen me. <laughs> so understand it from this dynamic. These are all genetic realities. These are anatomical facts that are the inevitability of our existence on that level. 
But as it relates to this, it's simply, and I only highlighted it to make sure that you understand, there are differentiations, differentiation between male and female. However, there is also opportunity for us to utilize the truth of God's word in order to help us with these differences to understand one another in hopes that we will be able to stand one another. <laughs> Did y'all get that? Tell your neighbor, keep up. He going somewhere. Well, what, what did he mean? What, what, what did he say? No child left behind. Come on, I got you. The Bible is a wonderful tool, but often we fail to use it properly. It's the source of our truth. It is the source of our understanding. The Bible says, in all of your getting, get a what? Get an understanding. However, the problem is many times we're not getting an understanding because we don't read the Bible with the right expectation. So in order to use the Bible in order to understand that this person that God has anointed, ordained, assigned me to live the rest of my days with, it is imperative that you begin to utilize the tool of the Bible with the right filter. When you read the Bible, there should be two things that you're looking for, patterns and principles. The Bible is full of patterns and principles. Over and over again, it gives you a pattern of how God does things. And he does it this way in this life, in this generation, in the next generation, in the next generation, or in this family, and then that next generation of the family, and then he, he did this nation, and then that nation. His patterns are systematic. His patterns are, they're true. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. That's why we can use a book that has been written eons ago, 2,000 plus years ago, and it still have relativity to our circumstance today that we see ourselves in the pages of the Bible. It's because the Bible is written with a system of patterns. And so when you read the Bible, you need to look at it intrinsic, with look deeper and try to see, God, what is the pattern of this situation, this circumstance, this dynamic, this experience? What is the pattern so that I can better relate to the thing that I'm trying to relate to on the other side? Are y'all with me so far? Slap your neighbor and say, it's hot, but hell is hotter than this. Keep up. We're going somewhere. <laughs> no, slap them till the taste leaves their mouth. I'm just kidding. Don't slap them for real. Patterns, but then there's also principles. You also, you have patterns, and you also have to deal with the relativity of principles. Patterns serve as a model. They're a blueprint. Principles serve as laws, regulations, guards, or guides, guardrails even, if you will, to complete a project. Patterns are models. Principles are laws, rules, regulations. Therefore, when you read the word of God, you should look for both patterns and principles. You should look for the systematic approach because it highlights there's something different. There's something off here. There's something not normal. There's something out of the norm. And then you look at the principles because they tell you what to do with what it is that's out of the norms. Are you with me? Malachi 3 and 8. This is going to seem like I'm veering off the beaten path, but I promise I'm going somewhere. Will, will a man rob God? Yes. How? In tithe and in, in offering. How does he rob God? In tithe and offering. Verse 9. You are cursed with a curse. You and your, you're robbing God. You and the whole nation. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that may be meet in my house and prove me now this day, saith the Lord. See if I won't open up the window of heaven. Pour you out blessings that there not be no room enough to receive. I'll rebuke the devourer for you and so that you will not destroy your fruits or your soil and your vine and it shall yield or your field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations shall call you blessed. And you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I read it really fast because it's not the purpose of my message. It is part of the message to illustrate a point within the message. So pay attention. When you read this particular passage of scripture talking about the tithe, there is a pattern that you will see throughout the entire course of history within the text of the scriptural text. So the pattern is that God sees paying the tithe as obedience and as an act of worship. And there's a biblical pattern that has been established if you read the Bible from the life of Abraham, who was the first father, the father of the faith. You have Abraham, he tithed. Then you have Isaac. Isaac brought a tenth of his increase, he tithed. Then you have Jacob. You see the pattern from one generation, from granddaddy to daddy to the next generation to grandson or son. And then it continues throughout the course of the history or the course of the lineage within the text of the scripture. And so you see a pattern producing in this process. So it should cause you to highlight and say there's a pattern here. If God sees this as worship, bringing a tenth of my increase to the house of God or to, the, 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 to God himself, it's not the house of God. You bring it to God himself so that there will be me in God's house. And so when you bring that tenth of your increase to God, then you see a pattern of systematic practice that's taking place. But the principle is now that I see the pattern, what 
do I need to expect or what do I need to learn? What are the laws that govern this pattern of behavior? So the principles or the, 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 the laws or the regulation that governs this dynamic is called the law of firsts. It is the first. The principle says this, that the first that you bring to God honors him and it tells or communicates that he is first. It's not that God wants a tenth so that you choose a middle tenth or a last tenth, but it was always the first tenth, the first of their increase. So when they gave the first, the law is when you give your first, it positions me to know that you're honoring me above everything else. So then in return, I'm able to honor you by giving you blessings that you don't even have room enough to restore, causing your fruit to yield at the proper season and rebuking the enemy, Satan, Beelzebub, Lucifer, who comes to steal, kill and destroy. He can't touch what your increase is. Are y'all with me? So I'm not getting it. This is not a tithing sermon. I promise I'm talking about relationships. But if you're going to understand the relativity of our, of our composition, you must understand how the Bible is written, how we are to interpret and how we are to read the Bible. But more importantly, that there are also principles or rules that govern the patterns that we observe. Are y'all with me? Ooh, y'all making me work hard at 10 o'clock. In the back section, are you with me? Okay, I just want to make sure. Now. This is why this is important. It was important for me to, to make sure you got that. Because women and men are different in how they view both patterns and principles. Women, by nature, naturally can see patterns. It is something systematic. It is in your wiring. It's in your DNA, your composition. It's in your psychological approach to everything you instantly are drawn to and can see patterns whereas men have a harder time with this dynamic men have a greater regard to principles than women do i'm not saying again that all women's are women are principle less i'm saying that naturally our inclination is that we are drawn to patterns or principles women patterns men are stronger more strongly drawn towards principles Women see patterns. So here's the major difference. When women naturally pick up on patterns quicker than men, men don't be alarmed or offended. It's just the reality of our existence. She notices. When your pattern changes, so y'all see it now. At first, you're like, nah, that ain't true. I don't know about that. Oh, no, it's true. She knows your patterns, and she knows what you'll do. Anybody ever went out of the house, you forgot some men, you forgot something. You turned around to go back in the house, and when you got to the door, <laughs> she picked up on the pattern. I can't find my keys. Did you look? No, this is what gets me. Did you look under such and such? Did you look in your office? Did you look in this place? I looked in all those places. And she walks back to the same place. <laughs> because she understands my... Come on, somebody. You put your phone on silent. You'll never put your phone on silent. Ain't trying to get nobody in trouble up in here or nothing, but why you put your phone on silent? You never do. You came home and took a bath. <laughs> you never come straight home and take a bath. Oh, it, it, the air wasn't on at church today. It was a little hotter than it normally is. I sweat a little bit more today. Women pick up naturally. It's an inclination of your heart. You pick up on patterns you can ask a man the same questions and he will not be able to tell you I don't know <laughs> women pick up on patterns so well they know the pattern of the skirt of the individual that came and spoke to you three months ago at 3 5 p.m. in the afternoon while you were pumping gas <laughs> a 
And brothers are blindsided like, what are you? She had on fishnet pantyhose. The skirt was from Lane Bryant. Pray for him. I'm, I'm, I'm trying, yo. <laughs> so, women pick up on patterns, but we struggle with principles. And in order to understand your man, in order to understand your husband, I'm going to specifically say husband, because I want to promote courtship and not dating. <laughs> Sisters, you, you need to have a shirt. Y'all give me my cut when you sell them. We need shirts that say, no time to waste. No time to waste. I ain't got time to be playing no games. I'm not trying to date. I'm trying to court. I'm, in other words, I'm trying to push towards an end that will be pleasing in the sight of God that will cause me to find somebody I can spend the rest of my days with. Are y'all with me? So yeah, that, that being the, the case, I want to reposition my words to accommodate that. In un order to understand your husband, you must go back to the origin of his creation. His creation didn't start with his mother's womb, but I'm talking about the origin of the creation of mankind. And when you understand mankind and the origin of creation, it will help illuminate and give you a greater understanding of how to relate to him in your contemporary relationship. You got to go back to Genesis, the second chapter. Come on and go with me. Genesis 2, 7 through 9. Genesis 2, 7, 8, and 9. Genesis 2, 7 through 9. When you found it, you got it, say amen. Okay, I'll wait two seconds. Genesis 2, 7 through 9. Now, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Pay attention. The Lord God, start over here, formed out of the ground, Mankind, out of the dust of the ground, breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. Then man became a living soul. That was the creation. Then look at verse 8, which starts right here. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Are you with me? So he formed man. Then he went over here, and he planted a garden. And in the garden, he took the man that he had created and he put him in the garden. Verse 9, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every plant, every tree pleasant in the sight, good for food. The tree of life in the midst of the garden, the tree of good and knowledge, not knowledge of good and evil. He put those things in the garden, which he planted after he had made man. If you read on it, I don't have time to really deal with it. But if you read on, you'll find out that later on in the garden, he looked at man and said, it is not good for man to be alone. And so out of man, he took a rib and he created woman. Now, why is this important, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. You asked great questions. Let me explain it to you. Man was created in the wild. Woman was created in the garden. Are y'all with me? It was only after man's creation that he even created the garden. And he put man in the garden and therein he created woman. So, man has a wild nature. <laughs> because he wasn't created in the garden. But he was created in the wild. Now this is a major difference and can be a major issue in the relationship. If we do not understand the wild nature of man. The biggest challenge to mankind or to males in our society, especially now, is the emasculation and redefinition of what a real man is supposed to be. But men were created to have a wild nature. They were created in the wild. Now, let me make sure I clarify and qualify what wild is and isn't. What it is not is unruly. Without regard to principles. 
It's not meant to be something that you're so wild that you, there is no regard to principles or laws or regulations which are given to us by God. But what it does mean is that man naturally and innate within himself has an explorer or an adventurous side. He likes to be adventurous. And it's not something that is taught. It's not something that's conditioned. It's something that's innate. It's naturally within him. Sisters, am I helping y'all yet? Okay, let me break it down even further. Anybody ever had to teach a little toddler boy how to jump off a high furniture? Let me just let you think about it for a minute. Have you ever had to come and say, come here, son. Let me show you how to jump on the bed and reach up and try to grab the ceiling fan. <laughs> let me teach you that. But yet and still, you walk in the bedroom and guess what? They naturally have an adventure. And you, you've heard it said like this, just let that boy be a boy. Which means let him have his wild and adventurous side. And it's only now recently that really parenting has taken, taken on a different form and, and where we allow our, our, our boys to have a more wilder side. It's still a problem or a challenge in our adult man, men, but in the household, we have at least made a few adjustments. For example, we no longer have plastic on the furniture. Some of us don't have the plastic runner You know the one that, that my brothers used to flip over on the wrong side so that when my daddy got up with his feet bare? My brothers. I remember, I remember one day, you know, I'm from the South. And things are a little bit different now. You guys have, you know, fancy st stuff. It's, you use, you know, when you put lotion on your face or you put protective covering over your face, as far as moisturizer is concerned and protective, you, you use like Aveeno and <laughs> Eucerin and, you know. Y'all got all these fancy, you know, $8 a bottle. We had... Good old Vaseline. Not even a dollar for a whole big old jump. My mama used to call us in, come here. You go out the house to play, you look like a new penny. Shining like new money. And she used to slap it on with them heavy hands. Come here. Come here, let me put something on your hands. <laughs> Y'all so bougie now. So my wife, when my babies were babies, she put Vaseline on the, you know, soften their skin and protect them from the elements. And she put the Vaseline on the face. One day, my son decided, wild side, wild child, oh boy, my son decided he wanted to explore and be adventurous. Mama puts this on me every day. I'm going to put something on myself. The problem is, he put his whole hand, pulled out as much as he could. So when I walk in the room, the boy halfway can't breathe. He's got a half look of help and a half look of don't kill me. <laughs> Nobody had to teach him to do that. It's the wild nature. It's the adventurous, the exploring nature of mankind. And so women, your responsibility now is to understand the role of the man, the, the personality of the man, the, the characteristics, the trait, the origin. 
You got to better understand how they function, how they think, how they process, how they're wired. Because if you don't understand how your husbands are wired, then you're going to have contention. And it will not be contention that is even legitimate. It's just simply a misunderstanding. One of the worst things in the world is for you to be arguing and y'all saying the same thing. You're just understanding it in a different way. Are y'all with me? Five things right quick. I don't have time to, to, to spend a lot on this, but so I'm going to rush through this. The five things that I have found, and this is a study that I got from a, a, a gentleman named Harley. He's incredible at marriage counseling. He's got several books. He's got a lot of books that he's written, and he, he, he's, uh, he's got one that's building an affair-proof marriage. It's absolutely amazing. And so uh, if you want to do more discovery, more study on this, by all means, feel free to jump in and find his work because he's incredible. Now, I pulled five things and only five things because of this for the sake of time. But I think these are five things that he has highlighted as precedents and priorities if you're going to understand his needs. Our responsibility is to meet the needs of our spouse as well as we're meeting our own. That's a biblical principle that has nothing to do with me. The Bible says love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Like, love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind. Then the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So he even puts it in the same plane as loving God. Loving our neighbor is just as a priority said, and the second is like unto it. Meaning it's very similar, except that this one is to love your neighbor, which says that you're loving yourself. So it's a biblical principle that we should be trying to meet each other's needs. Are you with me? Anything different is called selfishness, self-centeredness, and it builds pride. And pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit, which is arrogance. That you're so puffed up that you believe it, the rules don't, the principles don't apply to me. It goes before a what? A fall. Slap your neighbor and say, don't fall. Push them this time. Say, don't fall. Five things. Here we go. Right quick. Five things. Number one on the list, the absolute most important priority. Men, men need this probably more than anybody, anything else. Women, you've got to understand this is one of their emotional needs. These are emotional needs. They absolutely have to have this. This is the number one priority, number one emotional need on the list for men. It is sexual fulfillment. Brothers? That was your cue. <laughs> Watch this. The, the, the typical wife doesn't understand her husband's deep need for sex, just as the typical husband doesn't understand his wife's need for deep affection. <laughs> I was trying to give y'all a chance. <laughs> affection is the environment, however, of the marriage. But sex is the special event. The challenge becomes when you take and pervert the whole purpose of sex and make it your weapon. In an effort to try to coerce him into more affection. <laughs> See, watch this. Women are emotionally drawn or with when women are emotionally withdrawn from their husband. They are notoriously unwilling to have sex with them when they are emotionally withdrawn. Are you with me? Men, on the other hand, can be emotionally withdrawn <laughs> and you walk in with the right thing on at the right time, doesn't matter about their emotional withdrawing, they're going to try to make a deposit. <laughs> Pray for me, don't talk about me. <laughs> Very rarely will you see a man turn down an opportunity to have sexual relations or intercourse with their wives, even if they feel disconnected. Whereas women, they long for the emotional or the affectionate connectivity that it is their desire is more for the intimacy than it is for the actual act. That's why you hear things like, can you just hold me for a minute? 
and brothers are saying, Lord, help us, Jesus. So instead of saying amen, instead of pushing it, instead of prodding on it, understand and seek to better understand his wiring. That naturally he is not wired for that. Here's the difference. With much, men have a much higher sex drive, and the primary reason for their sex is not to relieve their desire for intimacy. It's to relieve their sexual craving. Whereas women's primary reason is the intimacy or emotional bonding. And it's not that one is wrong or the other is wrong. It's simply how they are created. It is the wild nature that exists within man that that is an emotional need of his, of his life. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 4. This, the Bible addresses all of this. I don't want you to think I'm giving you opinion, so I want to couch it in the word of God. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 and 4 says this. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. And likewise, the wife, the wife, the wife <laughs> to her husband. Brothers! trying to help y'all in this place trying to make sure that the women understand us better verse 4 the wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband <laughs> but the bible says the bible says get on in here gal All right, all right, all right. We got to read the rest of it. <laughs> In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Why well, y'all got to pinch your lips when you clap? So understand, you pervert the whole intent, the whole purpose, the whole meaning of intercourse in a relationship, in a marital relationship. I want to specify. You pervert the whole dynamic, which is beautiful, which is ordained by God. The, the benefits and the ramifications are intimacy, it's closeness, it's affection, but it's also the fulfillment. It's his need being met while yours is equally being met because you have mutual submission to one another. Are you with me? And so it is a beautiful thing. It is a natural thing. It is a phenomenal thing. However, you pervert it when you use it as your personal weapon because that is a derivative of your own flesh. So you're trying to do it to create an outcome that it intrinsically cannot create because it's flawed at its conception. It comes from self-centeredness. It comes from your own selfish desires. The Bible even addresses our quarrels. Where do they come from? Do they not come from our own selfish desires? It's us wanting to get out of this what we want because we want it the way we want it. And we want you and you didn't do this and you didn't do that. And because you didn't do this and you didn't do that, you ain't going to do this. <laughs> That's not the purpose. That's not the intention. It is to be an intimate relationship dynamic it is the special event that culminates the affection that you long for foreplay is more than just in the bedroom and so the affectionate process begins before you know and, and this is not something that has to be naturally taught brothers you've been doing it since you were kids it's just who we are let me just remind you, remember the little girl you liked in your third grade class? The one that you hit all the time? <laughs> or that you pulled a ponytail or that you pushed and you only did it because you liked her? 
well, what are you doing now? You want to play? You all in the bed pushing. What you doing? You sleep? What you doing? Hey. <laughs> no. Is he looking? Now, the Holy Ghost warned me. The Holy Ghost warned me because here's the dynamic that I don't want to make sure I create or make sure that I don't create in your relationship. This is what you have to understand. If you now know that that is the number one emotional need of man, and now that man is not seeking you, looking out, or yearning for that need to be met by you, women, precautionary warning. Do not jump to the conclusion that because that's his number one need and he ain't getting it met here, that he's not getting it met somewhere else. Because some of you had already concluded before you left the sanctuary, ooh, if he ain't getting his needs met here and this is his number one need, where are you getting it met? You about to go home with bullets and gun smoke. There are other factors to contribute to this. There's age. If you didn't catch them between 18 and 21, four or five times at a time, hang it up. <laughs> Done, over, out. Because they reach their maturity in that dynamic faster and earlier than women do. Are you with me? This is a grown folk sermon, and I'm trying my best to keep it grown and not go here so y'all got to say amen so I know you got it okay good so you cannot relegate it to just all inclusive it has to be inclusive of all the variables all the dynamics there are also some medical challenges and men sometimes in certain portions of life dealing with certain issues different certain medical challenges certain certain dynamics of their own anatomical composition that cause them to be challenged in this way somebody should thank God in this day for the pharmaceutical industry and I'm moving right along. As many times the spirit is willing. Most of men's escapades don't happen in the physical. They happen in the mind. Most of them. Men do a lot of conversation and do a lot. Ooh, ooh I would. No, you wouldn't. Three minutes. Dougie fresh you out. No, you wouldn't. It's all right here. You're having most of it right here. So do not be alarmed. Y'all hurry up and get me out of this. Number two. My mama sitting in here. Y'all need to remind me. Mama, I don't do none of that. I'm a virgin in my heart. Number two. Companionship. Men have an emotional need for companionship. Not in the same way as women. Women want a companion because they want someone that they can share their feelings and their emotions with. Someone that can actually encourage them. That can share their feelings and emotions with them. And someone they can lean on. They want somebody that's there. Not just there physically, but there in, in, in every way. Psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. They're present with them. They want a companion. It's not the same with men. Women want an emotional companion, but men want a recreational companion. They want somebody they can play with. See, spending recreational time with your wife is ranked number two only to sexual needs as it relates to your emotional needs. So they want an emotional companion. Now, here's the challenge, and I'm going to rush through this. A couple that plays together stays together. You always heard a couple that prays together. Yes, that is important. That is one of the essential needs of a family in general, prayer. But a couple that plays together also stays together. Are you with me? So what that means is whatever interest that you experienced when you were young, those interests, those dynamics are still prevalent. Meaning that if he liked football and you acted like you liked football, 
he fell in love with the fact that you liked football as much as he liked football. You wanted to watch television like he wanted to watch television to catch the game. You wanted to know the stats. Now tell me, what does that mean? What does that mean, Hut? What is that? Huh? A touchdown. What is, now what is the little thingy at the end? You got into it. You became a fan of it. You wanted to go to the games, but then life happened. And when life happened, your interest changed, your time changed, your commitment changed, your dedication to other things became greater. But please understand that men emotionally yearn for, long for that recreational, and it's necessary for a healthy relationship, the recreational companionship. Because what happens is he'll, he'll, he'll find someone else, some other activity is his favorite, or whatever his favorite activity is. He'll find someone else who enjoys that activity, and then that person becomes his recreational companion. And if that person is a woman, it opens up your marriage for an affair. Are you with me? So you have to find something, couples, you have to find something, husbands and wives, that is your recreational activity with your spouse. Doesn't mean that you're with them day in and day out all the time because that would drive me absolutely crazy. But there has to be something that we do. Something that I enjoy, that you enjoy, some commonality that we do. Whether it's just walking. We take our neighborhood walks in the mornings or in the evenings. We walk together. And that's our time to have a, an activity with one another. Something that we uniquely can call our own and we have this special time together. Amos 3 and 3 says, can two walk together except they agree? You have to be on one accord. You have to be in agreement with one another. Genesis 2 and 18 says, Now the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper, suitable and complementary for him. Amen? Amen? Number three, husband wants or needs, is one of the emotional needs is an attractive spouse. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. <laughs> now, I want to help everybody out. Attractiveness is not I'm sorry, attractiveness is what you do with what you have. So there's no wrong or right thing to be attractive. It's not a specific weight, dress size. It's not a specific dynamic of your external personality that causes you to be attractive. But attractiveness comes and emanates from the inside. That's where it begins. Are you with me? So what it means ultimately is that Every man wants, yearns for, and longs for an individual who keeps herself together. Proverbs 31 says this. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. In other words, she's strong. She's working. She's viral. She's dependable. She's supportive. But then verse 2, 22 says this, Proverbs 31 22, she makes coverings for her bed, still working. Now watch this. She is clothed in fine linen, which is an, it is an expensive garment. In other words, it is a, a garment that is representative of someone who is being intentional about their ex exterior appearance and with purple, which is the color of royalty. She is clothed. This is a Proverbs 31 woman. Clothed in linen and royalty. She treats herself as if she knows the royalty that is on the inside and she wants an external exemplification of the royalty that she actually is. Are y'all with me? Now, that being said, the same ones of you who clapped. What I should never see is you driving down the street in your silk sleeping bonnet. Well, I'm just going to run out. No, you're not. I'm just going to run right and come right back. No, you're not. I think one of the few times, I don't know if you're old enough to remember this, but me and Kenneth will, one of the few times I saw my dad, like, really, really check my mama. Because I'm telling you, my dad, he recognized very early what kind of woman he was married to. And he knew very clearly, she is not the one. As a matter of fact, I could tell you 
definitively in my spirit, I believe he knew that if he had even talked with the wrong tone, not to go to sleep. <laughs> it was clear, understood. We was all scared to go to sleep. <laughs> oh, we. So this was one of the rare, if not the only time I ever saw him say, no, you're not. My mama had her rollers in her head, <laughs> as she did every night of my life. And she was on her way out the front door. Where you going? It's like, I'm getting ready to run off here. No, you're not. Not with them rollers in your head. So understand, let me tell you this. Women, let me help you out. Brothers want to be able to celebrate the beauty, internal and external, of everything you are. And they want everybody else to see you at their best, not to be self-centered, but because they're so proud of who God has blessed them to have. I want everybody to know that I have the beauty. Women, no one should ever have to question or challenge you on the, on the, on the, the, the item of hygiene. I said hygiene. Y'all trying to figure out what I said. Hygiene. H-Y-G. What did he say? Appearance matters. And it's not mattering just because you want people to be pleased with you. But it says that you know who you are. It says that you know who God has made you. Every woman would benefit from evaluating every aspect of your image that you project. Your posture, your hairstyle, doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It's just your choice. But you wear it with such confidence and you do it so well. Clothing, your gestures, your makeup, your weight, not relative to any specific weight or body type or shape. But you feeling great about your health, about who you are about you as an individual. This is something that men emotionally yearn for in a woman. Are you with me? But y'all been married for so long that we trying to figure out where did you go? <laughs> what, what, what happened was, number four, domestic bliss. Home life is free of stress and worry. After work each day, his wife greets him lovingly at the door. And they're well-behaved children. I'm so glad to see him. And he enters the comfort of a well-maintained home. As his wife urges him to relax before having dinner. And the aroma <laughs> begins to permeate the atmosphere wafting from the kitchen and conversation at dinner is enjoyable and free of conflict or request. <laughs> Later, the family goes out together for an evening stroll in the community. And he returns to put the children to bed with no hassle, no fuss. And then he and his wife relax, talk together for a while. Watch a little television. And at a reasonable hour, they adjourn to go to bed to make love. <laughs> now, the last service, brother hollered out, where I get that at? In your dreams. <laughs> I use that analogy because that's, of course, way over the top. But it shouldn't be so far-fetched. And it's not completely unreasonable to expect a, a domicile that gives you peace. You fight all day long. You fight, you do company politics. You deal with you know, envy and jealousy from coworkers, colleagues, fake, fickle, phony friends. You deal with family members that you, you can't do nothing about it because they steal your family. 
then you have a society and a culture and maybe even a government in some regards that is castigating you, isolating you, and trying to keep you out. The last place that any man wants to come home and still have to fight is in his own house. They deal with so much. They carry so much. And because they carry it so well, you don't even know the breadth of all that men carry. They're not naturally emotive. They're not naturally articulating their feelings to you. Women, they find networks of people and they clearly articulate their feelings. <laughs> clearly. Men will hold it in and you are generally, in, in most relationships, you are generally the only true sounding board and friend that they actually have. And so the last thing that you want to do is betray that relationship by not allowing them to feel comfortable and at peace in their home to use you as their eternal friend, their friend to the end of this life. Are you with me? Let me tell you what the Bible says about women that don't understand this dynamic or this emotional need of a man. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll qualify it later on, but Proverbs 27 and 15, oh, I got to hurry up. It says, a quarrelsome wife is like dripping, is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Oh <laughs> brother said, my God. I feel you, doc. I feel you. Proverbs 21 and 9. I want to make sure that you know I'm not making this up. It's in the Bible. Go to yours. Proverbs 21 and 9. It says it's better to live on the corner of a roof. <laughs> Brothers. <laughs> to share a wife with a quarter. I like the way the Message Bible says it. Proverbs 25 and 4. Message Bible says better to live alone in a tumble down shack. Then share a mansion with a nagging spouse. <laughs> Sisters, I'm not going to leave y'all hanging. Let me help you out. Brothers, here's what you need to do. You need to help her help you to create. Y'all haven't even heard the rest of what I'm about to say. Amen. But brothers, you need to help her help you create a peaceable domicile. The bliss of a, of a domicile that you feel peace coming into. This is what it boils down to, a fair division of labor. You got to begin to discuss ways to actually eliminate and help and support each other and the labor that is now existing in the house, but your, your expectations cannot be unreasonable. You got to discuss the ways you have possibly even burdened each other with responsibilities. With a standard of living that requires more time at work than you like. With children's activities that are more time consuming than you anticipated. With church or even volunteer work that's taking away from your family. With hobbies and re recreational interests that take time and resources away from the highest priorities in your family. These are conversations that you now have to begin to have. And you have to come and become one on one accord rather at least you have to become one on one accord with what is going to work to help you create this blissful domicile. Are you with me? Because at the end of the day, what you want to do is you want to come home and you want everybody in the house. She's going to study your patterns. It's going to happen, period. But you want everybody to understand your principles. For example, when I get home, I don't care who's over, family, friend, or foe. That chair, this one. This one right in front of the TV. That's my chair. When my kids see me come in the room and they're in my chair, they, oh, daddy, let me get out your chair. That's daddy's chair. I want a peaceful domicile. Stay out of daddy's chair. When you get the big piece of chicken. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Number five, I'm done. Admiration, play, Jason. Would have been done if he would have just started playing. <laughs> Admiration. It does two things for men. It motivates and it rewards. And we need both. 
We need motivation. I'm torn down in every side, in every way, in every area of life. What I need now is for my wife to build me up. I need her to encourage me. I need her to enlighten me. It doesn't mean that you don't disagree. I don't want to paint this picture where it's just like, oh, I can never disagree with you because I have to create domicile bliss or domestic bliss. No, I'm not saying that. But there's a difference between complaining and criticizing. Complaining, let me give you the difference. Complaining is the expression of a problem that you would like to solve. Criticizing is giving that same expression of the problem but with an insult. That's what makes the difference. It's not that we won't ever disagree. My wife and I in, how long have we been married? 18 or 19 years. Long time. We have never had an argument. Never. Not one time have we ever had an argument. Here's the catch. It doesn't mean that we've never disagreed. But our conversation and our communication, first of all, she just has figured out how to manhandling, handle me with a soft tone. So I, I've been whooped and don't even know most of the time I just got whooped. <laughs> Be three days later, I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Did she say? So she's figured out the secret to this dynamic. My mother has the same thing. She's figured out the secret of this thing. I asked my mother this this week. <laughs> I was going around the church. They made me do social media. And some of you might have jumped on. But I went around the church and asked people who've been married lengthy periods of time. It's like, what do you think is the key to success? What advice would you give to other people? And so I went in my mother's office who hates to be on camera and hates to be in the spotlight. It's, it's crazy because I feel like when I look at my wife and I look at my mother, she's more like her mama than she is my mama. Actually, when y'all look at her, you look at them and they look just alike. But they are just alike. So just like my wife doesn't like to be in the spotlight, she doesn't like to be in the spotlight. But I made her. I just bombarded her office. I bust in there with the camera crew. We're going to talk today. So I asked her a question. I said, you all have been married almost 50 years now. What would you say would be the key to success? What would you give people advice? She says, well, she says, and it was so simple. But when I say powerful, it was powerful. She said, Here's, here it is. Accept him for who he is and work on you. <laughs> Sisters, you'll never straighten him out. Get him together. It's never going to happen. So what you have to do is get yourself together and allow God the opportunity to get him together. Are you with me? Ephesians 5 and 33, write it down. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, brothers, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I'm disrespected in every walk of life. I've had police officers to disrespect me. I've had friends to disrespect me. I've had church members to disrespect me. So the last thing I want is to go home and have my own wife disrespect me. You've got to have admiration. They want admiration. They want you to admire them. They want you to be so proud of them as they're so proud of you. They long for that. They may never tell you that. They may never say it. It may never come out of their mouth. But they long for that. Even as a little boy, they longed for that. Did I do good? Was that okay? Is that a good job? And how many of us grew up with that void? And so now, women of God, you have an opportunity to minister to them in ways that their parents may or may not even had to minister to them. You have ways now to nurture them and help them to be lifted up and empowered and encouraged. You have ways to let them know that I admire you. Say it to him. I like this about you. My wife started giving me words of affirmation. I promise you, my chest got big. You're the best husband because you always take care of us. You always seem to work things out. You always make sure that we have the best. You all, I'm like, yeah, I do, don't I? I do. That's me. It works. And they need to be affirmed. They need to know you admire them. Are you with me? 
when you look at them, look at them like y'all used to look at each other. Take it back to square one, day one. Of course, we reciprocate on the other end, brothers to the sisters, but today is about the sisters. So all women of God in this place stand. Every woman, please stand. Come on, Minister Aquanita. Turning it over into your hands. <laughs> 